The digital revolution has sparked lots of new ideas. The model of business has changed, which means the model of marketing has changed. Most people nowadays go and search for their next partner through their network. And where does their network live? Usually on social media. I had to make quite a scary decision. We're not going to invest in email like we did. And thank God I did. My business will probably be dead now. A relationship is fundamentally the same based on trust. The initial connection there is about, am I talking to someone who can make this feel easy and therefore enjoyable? Because everyone's trying to juggle too many plates. What they want though is something subtly different. They want a lot of simplicity. I think there's three pillars. One is that attraction content in a more human way. The second one is the prove it piece, is we've done this before. And the third one is make it easy for people to fucking buy you. We're an industry of good ideas and we need an environment that helps facilitate good ideas. There's no doubt about it that ideas are slower and it's very hard to, to understand body language when it's just this bit. Better ideas come from us collaborating. You don't build those relationships and build those allies in the business and outside of the business. You can't build them on Zoom. I'm sorry, you just can't. Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Marketing in the Madness and we always do what it says on the tin, talk about the madness of the world of marketing. And today I have with me the fantastic Tony Spong. Now, Tony, I'm trying to map back. How long have we actually known it? 10 years? Maybe it, longer. It, it must be because I, I had bought a new car and I drove it down to Bournemouth when we first met. So that's about 10 years ago. Really. Yeah, it would well, be. I said bought a new car, an old new car, as it were. Yeah. It would have been because we were working with you guys, an agency that I worked at at the time on our value proposition, right. which is very strange because now my agency helps other agencies and tech companies with their value proposition. So how the world turns. Um, but essentially, so Tony, for those of you that don't know who Tony Spong is, Tony is, well, Tony, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Tell us about Tony and the AAR. Okay. Well, I'll start with me, shall I? Uh, so I joined Marketing Client Side. And um, loved it so much, um, but was fascinated by the creative element and where that came from and the alchemy involved in it. So I was very lucky that I got offered a job by one of the agencies that we were working with at the time. And I thought, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. So I skipped onto the agency side for a number of years. And originally, I was going to go back to client side because I thought, well, I'll, I'll see a spread of activities and different solutions, et cetera, and take that knowledge. But I've ended up in the middle now. So AAR is basically an intermediary that sits between clients and agencies. And the original business was based on simple matchmaking, if you like, to say there is too much choice out there. How does a client choose an agency? Could someone help with that choice making? And that's basically where the business started back in 1975, which wow. gives you an indication of if it was busy then, what it's like today. There's even more agencies to choose from out there and everyone trying to earn their pound and dollar, as it were. But we've evolved as well. So uh, over the last few years, we some of our research was indicating that clients have been doing a lot of restructuring. And as a consequence of that restructuring, how they want to do marketing is changing. But they don't know what they don't know about what's out in the marketplace. So our we found that we're being dragged upstream a lot more. So they don't even know if they need a new partner or what that partner might be yet. But they've got a straightened out business strategy, which is informing a new marketing strategy. But before they organize their marketing department, as it were, they want to know, well, what's possible and therefore where should I focus? Sometimes the answer's lying with the agencies they've already got. They've just got to rescope the work with them. And sometimes they've got a clear gap. And again, we, we can help. So... We're working upstream, much more consultative than we were in the in, in the past. And then that feeds other elements of what we can offer. So we're a much broader business now um, than we were 10 years ago when we first met. And downstream of that, the we're, we're getting asked with upskilling and training and performance management because, again, once you've got something new, you kind of go – is it working the way we're hoping it's working? Yeah. And if it's not working, how do I put it right? Going back to the beginning, which is, well, I don't know what I don't know about how to put it right either because the whole thing is new. So we're seeing a lot of work from that one end to the other now. So it's really exciting. So we're hiring more people. We've got different people, different skills, and that sparks fresh ideas. So 
there's a lot of vibrancy at AR at the moment and, and a lot of change in a, in, a, in a really exciting way. I mean, it's great to have seen how you guys have evolved to what has been a very changing market. And in fact, just off camera or off sound, uh, a minute ago, you were saying in, so you've been at the AAR now for 17 years, helping agencies and clients, you know, come together to do brilliant work. But you said something to me that was super interesting. And, and I feel like this as well, is you've never seen the world of marketing change so much in the whole 17 years you've been there. No, there's some really big questions being asked, partly because there's a lot of new people out there. So, you know, the digital revolution, as we know, has sparked lots of new ideas. Some, you know, will, will succeed and others will fail. But all that rapid learning in terms of what works and what doesn't work and where people uh, can fulfill needs, you know, uh, all the way back to, you know, Dyson and his digital this, that and the others and, and what have you, all the way to how e-commerce is changing the way we buy. You can buy straight off Instagram nowadays, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, as we know. So... There's the business, the model of business has changed, which means the model of marketing has changed as well. And what's been interesting is the speed with which they have to get through the marketing textbook now. Um, and it's really interesting because everyone wants that unicorn that will have world domination. And you look at the battle between Uber Eats, Deliveroo and Just Eat, very quickly they realised it wasn't just about performance media anymore. They had to build the brand. And now they're splurging huge amounts of money, not only nationally but then rapidly globally, on uh, on, on their brand in order to attract and, and deliver the next cohort of customers. Uh, not just the ones that that were, the, if you like, the low hanging fruit. So you've got you've got that at, at one broad level. So you've got the new people learning how to do marketing, making the same mistakes the heritage brands did, but learning faster. Sometimes they're just simply hiring people from the heritage brands to speed that process up. In the meantime, the heritage brands, the older businesses that have been there a long time, are realizing that they have to change now in order to stay alive in some instances and there's well documented uh the loss of retail in high streets etc and other brands that have disappeared from if you like that were around in our childhoods and and watching them fight back with marketing as well has been interesting so how how they adapt to this new world and how quickly or slowly they adapt to that has a big impact on what they can do so you've got some people in the digital sphere who are doing brand advertising and the brand advertising of yesterday is trying to do the digital stuff that the digital so you've kind of got these planets moving around a marketing ecosystem at the moment which is absolutely fascinating and it's it's where where I sit. I guess it's the best spectator sport in that regard. Yeah, I'm very envious. Of and we own. get it's a bit like being at the water cooler. People are coming up, filling up, and having a chat. So you kind of get what the issues are from both ends, which is really fascinating. Yeah, it's it's funny actually that you talk about you referenced Uber there um, because yesterday I got a black cab use just at the at Waterloo um got to the station and me and my daughter I was telling you Tony about this so this is funny guys um so yeah my daughter a week before we go on holiday has lost her passport so we got to Waterloo yesterday she has her appointment at half 11 we missed the first train and we had a very short period of time to get to the station so I was like you take because you can you can send someone on your behalf to the appointment as well so I was like I'll get a black cab you get the um tube and DLR and let's see who gets there first. She actually beat me. Um, fun fact. But anyway, the story isn't about that. The story is about the black cabbie. So I got in the black cab and we were chatting away and I was, we were talking about Uber and how, you know, that's changed for, because he was talking about the knowledge and I was like, what does it do? You know, do you have to still retrain on the knowledge because you've, you know, obviously now got you know, digital has hugely changed the, you know, the game for cabbies, let's be honest. Um, but he was like, yes, you do. But actually, obviously, it get, you know, we can see the speed, we can see traffic, there are things that the knowledge didn't give us. So that was interesting. But one thing that he really made me think was, because I was talking about thinking about Uber, because Uber often is cheaper. And that's why you go for that. Let's be honest, that's how they entered the market. Yeah. But then because of their approach to world domination and not looking after their cabbies and the, the drivers not getting paid enough, it's put a lot of people off because whoever thought, and I don't know if you know this brand, but literally as I was talking to him, we drove past the Bolt office. And I was like, isn't it funny? Because 
almost now Uber has become a heritage brand. Yeah. It's not done, you know, in terms of its brand equity, it has lost some because it hasn't treated its people well. And, you know, values are important to all of us in terms of the businesses that we give our money to, that they're looking after their people and their staff. You know, I don't shop at places like Sheen because I don't feel it's good and I don't want to uh, you know I'd rather spend a bit I mean I'm lucky that I can spend a bit more but so I think there's so many moving parts like Uber has done fantastic things with its brand equity like you say even if you're getting a Bolt or a, you're, you're ordering a, a, a black cab on Get you will still say I'm getting an Uber it's like they've they, they are a, they've got the Hoover word as it yeah, were yeah they've got the, the Hoover word team, they've yeah. earned that they've done really really well however other brands that I never thought could come into the market like Bolt who also offer other services I think in Lisbon they do and uh, well various other places but I've seen that they do the um, scooters they do the bikes so they're taking a different approach which I mean I just love because I've always worked in sales and marketing I just love seeing how those things are evolving and how they're able to bin, build their brand equity through digital through taking different approaches to their think product. how quickly that has happened i know so insane. some some of it you see brands that are or businesses that are trying to become brands i like to look at it that way and they're still in their teenage years and yet they've got to almost dress themselves up in a three-piece suit they've they're trying to be grown-ups but they're 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 happening so fast yeah that they're kind of out of, out of step with, with that. So it's a fascinating one to watch. Interestingly, on the knowledge, they're putting it to different use. So a friend of mine uh, coaches and trains cab drivers to do tours around London. So their capacity to store knowledge, so they've now used that in a different way, which is not just how to get from A to B, but how to take a tourist on proper tours around London with stacks and stacks of information. Uh, about the various things. So you get a personalised tour in a black cab, so that kills two birds with one stone. So they've used, they've found the thing that they're really strong at and turned it into something else and added value beyond just the A to B bit, which I think is brilliant. So that's really, really exciting. So, yeah. And um, I think that's what brands are doing, right? It's It's being more innovative. It's enabling us to try new things, be brave. I mean, I literally did a post about this this morning on LinkedIn, like be brave, you know, just fucking do it. Just don't be scared. Don't pre think, fuck it, I'll just try it. And I think that's what's happening in those startups and those newer businesses, maybe a bit more sometimes in the bigger businesses who have more red tape around what they're allowed to do. But you can see them, you know, NatWest and some of the huge, you know, banking groups have then, you know, got, startup parts, parts of the business. One of my clients is now Eon Next, which is like the, you know, baby brother or sister of Eon that are allowed to break the rules. But I mean, I just think, well, why don't you just let the main business <laughs> break the rules? But it is super interesting because they're almost starting these smaller little ecosystems of businesses or, you know, bearing fruit to a new business that is the rule breaker and let, look at them fly. Yeah. I mean, my, my life in marketing started in a new product development department of 50 people at NatWest Bank. Wow. Oh, there we go. I didn't even know so, that, and I, and I landed so, on that. And here we are again. So, and again, once they'd built the products that they needed and marketed, they, they shut the department down because they go, well, we've got enough products and services now. And, of course, that, that lasted a generation before it happens again. So what you've seen over time is that the innovational R&D departments of a lot of places, not in some of that, you know, the P&Gs of this world, that's, you know, that's their bread and butter. So it's fairly constant. But for the vast majority, you don't need it always on in the past. Mm. But now it's really interesting to say, is that a permanent feature or a cyclical feature? So is it one of those where it just needs, we need a moment of refreshment and then we'll run those products and services through the system, make our money and then do it again? Or in certain quarters, does it need to be constant? Yeah. And I think that's a real challenge. I don't know the answer yet. No. But I know this bit was predictable as part of the cycle of renewal whether it ends up rolling out the same way as it has done in the past or different is the kind of bit I'm interested to see from a historical point of view, as it were, to say, well, we did that in the past. I, I, in all this complexity, it's been interesting listening to, to Byron Sharp and, and Ritson talk about don't forget the basics. So there are things that are still valuable today that were valuable 20, 30 years ago as the foundation stones of good marketing. So... But there are different layers to it today. And I think that's finding, that's where the excitement is in trying to find out what they are. But how do you integrate them with, with established thinking? And I think that's what's hard for some of the bigger organizations where 
you know, it, we'll use the silo word no doubt more than once, but you inevitably you create a silo to optimize something. You know, you go, right, you guys focus on that and optimize the shit out of it, basically. Uh, it gets to a point when you go, but I'm, I need to create a new a new one. <laughs> yeah. Let's say more horizontal than vertical or whatever we it needs to be. That transition is hard. And that's why we're in going through this period of consultants from Accenture to McKinsey's all the way down to smaller ones because change is hard. And often you need someone from the outside to help with that. So you've got that structural thing going on as well as well as the actual new techniques and things that we're learning to cope with. So as I said earlier, there's so many changes going on at the same time and watching brands and agencies try and work together on those things is, is fascinating. I mean, it pretty much has to be CEO led. Yeah. At the moment, someone has to have a plan. Someone has to build the team to deliver the plan and go and we're ahead. You need that kind of leadership. It's very different, difficult to do it from the bottom up. Yeah, I think I that's think the, the change. Moment. Is it's the bravery to make the change? Like, I mean, look, my small little business, and we saw we really started to notice a couple of years ago because email regulations are changing. We used to run a lot of our you know outreach campaigns for our clients, you know, where we're doing lead generation for them via email, and we just started to see the results were getting worse and worse and worse. And it's a huge sign of the times. This is probably happening to lots of people. We've made a, a huge shift now. So probably 80% of the fantastic results we now deliver for our clients comes through social media because, I mean, this is going to lead on to my next question to you, because most people nowadays go and search for their next partner, the tech company they need through their network. And where does their network live? Usually on social media. For us, because we're in B2B marketing, that tends to be LinkedIn. They're not waiting for an email to land in their inbox to find their next partner, tech company, whatever it is to, to work with. They're going to their network on LinkedIn to ask their network or to search out or to be served some content. So that's where they live and breathe. And it's the same in our personal lives. Like, yep. I find everything that I want to buy from a fashion point of view, beauty point of view, things, design things for my house, paint on so on Instagram. My daughter does it on TikTok. The world has changed. How we operate has changed. So I had to make quite a scary decision a couple of years ago to go, we're not going to invest in email like we did. And thank God I did, because if I'd kept banging that bloody email drum, my business would probably be dead now. Like we vastly, I mean, we take a very human led approach to what we do on LinkedIn, which is why you see lots of videos yes. like this on there. And that's basically what we do for our clients. But it's, you know, it's, it was a kind of scary decision to make, but we had to, we had to just do it. And I'm so glad that we did. And that's, I think, you know, at larger scales, what's happening you know, across the world and in many, many businesses. The problem is sometimes the bigger businesses, there's so much to change in terms of staff, you know, the teams that they have, the setup of the business to make those changes. It's easy when you're, you know, me and you've got 10 staff, yes. not so easy when you're a huge business and that changes the whole structure of how you work. Yes. And you can't, it's, you know, it's that classic um, analogy of trying to change your wheel in the fast lane. And that's the point. You can't stop, and that's and that's why we're we're locked into short termism and things like that. They, everyone's just trying to fight to. Well, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute, and until it becomes the ultimate car crash, when you go right, we have to stop everything, yeah, because it's got that serious. So it's trying to anticipate some of that. So I think management and leadership are learning new skills about how to do this. I don't think it's out the other end yet. Yes, there will be some who are slightly ahead of others, almost a bit like Formula One where the telemetry gets sent back to some place in Banbury to tell them that by the next time the car comes around, they need to tweak this or that, and they can do that remotely. I mean, it would be brilliant if we could run businesses like that, but that's kind of almost where we've got to get to, that the the, the nodes that tell us what's going on can be actioned literally immediately Yeah. Uh, rather than it'll take a year for you to sort that out, which it seems to be a lot of the time at the moment. So, yeah, it's... Uh, Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, especially when it comes to technology, which is, you know, the world that we all now play in. Now, we've talked a fair bit about how marketing has evolved, and I probably could spend this whole podcast talking to you about that. But of course, you have a lot more knowledge about the client agency relationship. So of course, the world of marketing has changed. Therefore, how agencies and clients work together I also am assuming needs to change. So what what have you seen in terms of what clients need from agencies and I guess how agencies need to respond to that? 
I mean, it has and hasn't in a way. Some things are based, a relationship is fundamentally the same based on trust. Um, and clients are after that. Where What they want, though, is something subtly different. They want a lot of simplicity. They want you to debunk and demystify things. I'm not sure they want you to tell them they need to be brave no. at that moment. I think they want the reassurance that you don't have to be brave so that they've, you've got that, you're meeting someone who's done it before, calm down, take it easy. Here's, this is It's going to be simpler than you think, that sort of language. Yeah. So the, the initial connection there is about, am I talking to someone who can make this feel easy and therefore enjoyable? Because everyone is stressed at the moment. Everyone's trying to juggle too many plates. So to add to that, you go, I can't cope. So part of this initial engagement, especially if it's going to be a new one, is how do you fit into an already complicated ecosystem of 17 plus partners or whatever it is? So some empathy about I'm easy to plug in or I'm easy to get out, you know, could be yeah. just as important. But also how, what are the consequences for the agencies left and right above and below where I come in and I think those there's a lot of that not being done and being said initially uh, and I think that's something to under to, to say the relationship we're going to have is this but also I'm going to prove to you about the word collaboration we'll come back to that in a minute because I'm going to demonstrate through case study and stuff how we've collaborated not just with you but with other agencies and the one so then the client sat there going this is going to be easy to buy and that that's where it starts after that it's the same thing. Everyone is always rushing around. So all the briefs are always rubbish. Both sides admit it. And so some basic, so that we've always had that argument, right? The brief is, we've never had time to write a decent brief. So again, we're in a, we're in a new world. We're using new tools, new things. Do we expect people to write the perfect brief? Is it likely to have decayed over time and, and got worse? Well, probably. So again, I think the other aspect of the empathy is about education without being patronizing. How do you help them be better marketeers? So I always think the nice situation when you watch two groups come together, the client fundamentally believes if they choose that agency, they will be better at their job. They want to be better at their job. They don't want to give the job to the agency. <laughs> they want to learn on the job with the agency. And I think that's the heart of the relationship the mechanics of it hybrid working was is going to fundamentally change and again we're still trying to work out the best ways of all of those they'll come but at its heart i if i'm a marketeer on the client side i i want to learn from you so i can be better i i have to acknowledge that the reason i've hired you is you know something i don't know otherwise i'd have done it myself so show me what you know and make it accessible to me in the way that you deliver that if you make it too complicated, it sounds too, and I'm going to go, you're not helping the situation. This feels like it's going to be hard work. And, you know, that's the same in all our lives, from a tin opener to a vacuum cleaner to whatever. If it's hard work, you bin it and buy something that's just a little bit easier to use. So that, I think, is at, at, at its heart. And then, you know, then it's about not making the mistakes that any relationship would yeah. want to avoid, basically. Yeah. It's funny, though, isn't it? Because I think people forget that you're having a relationship. You know, this is, I guess, the premise of my entire business, like people by people. Yes, you know, gone are the days of, you know, extent. I'm not saying marketing content isn't like needed, but the type of marketing content that you put out needs to change now. It's got to be human led. People want to buy people. People are buying into having a relationship with you and your team. So therefore, if you're not showing you and your team in your marketing, it's going to make it harder for people to buy you. So I think there's a there's been a bit of a shift in terms of how I see agencies need to market themselves. I'm not saying the long form reports, etc., are not needed because there's I mean, you, I love your the report that you guys do, for instance. You, know, you do, you want that layer of detail, but you also need to market it in a more human way. So things that we're doing for our clients at the moment where we've either helped them develop a report or they've got a report that they've written internally is we go, we interview the contributors and the clients who featured in that report in short little video snippets to bring it to life. So I think how agencies attract is changing. It's not, it's less polished marketing content it, because people are buying people it's got to you've got to show up as a person 
I think there's three pillars, I hope, that that I stand by that kind of sit with, I think, what you're saying here. And I, I want to dig into all of them, but particularly the third one, because I think it's something that is changing a lot for agencies and they need to get on it. So one is that attraction content in a more human way. Like, how do you show that you're a safe pair of, safe pair of hands, you're trusted, you're nice people, that, you know, you can post that content out on LinkedIn or wherever it is that you are that will attract the right you know, prospects for you. So there's that thought leadership yeah, content thought that, leadership. yeah, kit that ticks the box. We know what we're talking about. We can help you. We understand the problems that you solve. The client is hopefully problem aware and we can solve that. We're here. We're also problem aware and we've solved that for other people, which is actually the second one, because the second one is exactly what you say is the prove it piece is we've done this before. Don't worry. We've been on that journey. That problem that you're having, we've solved for X, Y, Z clients. We know how to do it. We're a safe pair of hands. You can trust us. So thought leadership, prove that we can do it. And then the third one, which I think is really interesting, and we make sure we have all of these types of content in our go-to-market strategies for our clients, is make it easy for people to fucking buy you. <laughs> because if you can't productize your offering or there's not an easy way to get a foot in the door and it's this overly complex, um, you know, bespoke quoted thing that people don't understand what to buy you're you're going to get lost because more often now certainly what we're seeing and we actually today work with more tech companies than we do agencies they're pitching up against the tech companies a lot of the tech tech companies have got teams in now that can actually start delivering the the tech for them the tech companies are getting smarter they're bringing in smaller teams not agency side but that can do the implementation so if agencies don't start to productize their offering and make it easier for clients to buy them, the tech companies, I think, could really start to overtake. And there are lots of them. I mean, my brother's just started working one, at one where they do, you know, they're a tech company, but they can do the implementation. And I think at the heart of that is someone, you need someone who's knowledgeable. And I, the issue we have now is that because of all the silos and specialisms within agencies, especially in, in London, because it, it's it's such a big centre of them. It's it drives specialisms, uh, and you know that's a it, it's almost like a Darwinian thing where there's enough mutations in London that it, it and any big city, creative city, you know Silicon Valley, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, on the on the kind of client side, what we've got a shortage of is someone who knows three things. We've got plenty of people who know one thing. The client wants one person who knows three things, four things, five things. So the hor- the the person who understands the breadth of it, obviously you can't just magic them out of the air. The race is on to find, because that then becomes the linchpin for that relationship. And the trust that then is built is that you are going to get the right answer rather than the only answer I can give you, which is kind of where we've, we've at. So there's definitely a point at the moment where clients are looking to, to, to go, look, we know the individual things. We've tested them over the last 10 years. We know how to do that, how to do this, how to do that. There now must be a moment when you can put certain things together because they operate in the same part of the ecosystem or whatever, and that's what's been happening. So we're seeing PR agencies and social agencies coming together. We're seeing this and that, performance and traditional media coming together, et cetera, et cetera. And then brand social and advertising. So the brand side. So they're coming together and new ways of, of, of working. So the knowledge base is, is being built up, but the, the, the client, again, just wants that that easy access point, someone who knows lots of things to help pull all of that together. And, uh, and uh, it's not, it's not there yet. What drives that though is better questions. So in order to demonstrate that, you know, what the client needs, if you ask a sensible question, that's often more powerful than telling them something. Cause if they don't know what they don't know, you can show as many case studies as you like and they go, I don't know how you got there. Cause I've never done it before. So part of it is understanding where the client's knowledge is and making sure you go and meet them and then bring them forward. Yes, of course, some clients will go, you know, I know what you're talking about. That's fine. But you have to work that out and sometimes in the room and live. And that's the art of a good salesperson on the one hand, but a good, you know, client lead on, on another is to, what are the key questions I need to ask this client so I know how to steer them towards the simple answer, the right product, et cetera, et cetera. So that is not there yet um there's a lot of i can show you the end product and it, and you've got to work out how i got there and you're going to go well you've got to help them as a result of that there's a lot of work 
that, that we do with agencies in just how to tell their story and how many options they might need now in telling their story because they might be meeting different clients at different stages of, of knowledge and stuff. So that narrative arc becomes a bit more important. But that's where the emotion comes in and where the empathy comes in yeah. and the differentiation comes in. Yeah. Because, you know, I was at an agency the other day and I said, look, I said, the case studies are great, wonderful, but if I put my hand over your logo, they're constructed exactly the same way as everyone else and I wouldn't know it was you. So where's your brand in your case study? I mean, that that for agencies is vitally important. Don't Don't leave it in the front few slides. <laughs> Drive it all the way through, all the way through to the case study so that they really, really know that you're going to be a useful partner but different than, than the other ones they've been watching. Yeah, well, ha have a tone of voice, right? It's so important. Like, you know, I bang on about, for us, it's, you know, all about being really human. And whenever we're writing any content, I always push back to the team, like, write like you're writing to your best friend. If it doesn't sound like something that you, if it's too... For some reason, everyone wants to go corporate with their language. We telephone the voice, we call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Have a telephone. <laughs> like, are you chatting to your mate on the phone? Yes, that's yeah. how, honestly, that's how, and it's, that's how we write everything. Like, that's the street tonality, and I'm and I'm really, really strict with that. And we try to push our clients to get more like that. Certainly in the outreach and the campaigns we're doing for them, because. We know it works. Of course, you know, CTOs and some of the people that we're marketing to, we need to, you know, evolve that language slightly. But I think having a strong tone of voice Massively that important. really helps identify who you are is, and you, I, you see it. I mean, especially now we've got, I mean, look, ChatGPT, everyone's using chat to create their content or trying to teach chat their own tone of voice. It's it's not clever enough yet. It's There are some great platforms out there that do help you get there. Yeah. But even then they go a bit wavy like I got them to write a job I got Jasper to write a job description for me the other day and it was just, it you know I've taught it our t tone of voice at street we've got quite a fun you know very human yeah, yeah. jovial in some ways you know quite mm. risky you know tone of voice but it wrote oh gosh it was like trying to say like set for the stars and stellar and uh, we did use some of it because it was quite inspiring and showing that we're different and you know when everyone else zigzag and all this kind of stuff but it went it just goes too far so I think you've got to be really you've got to be really clear about your tone of voice and yeah show up daring to be a bit different which is why i mean you know and again as a consequence of all the other changes we've seen an uptick in in what i would call traditional brand strategy briefs so you as i mentioned we've got business strategy being changed marketing strategies being changed a lot of foundational stuff so a lot of clients are going back to brand and going well we've we've just knocked the business out you know, out of shape a bit. Our employees are feeling a bit bruised as well. And we've got this new new approach to the market. We got, might have new offerings, et cetera. How do we show up? And the strategy needs to help both the organizational design as well as the operational design. So some really smart clients are realizing that they need to put, that's where they're putting the foot on the ball for a little bit of time to say, we've got to get that right. And then that will be the filter when we're running really fast, we can make the right decisions on social media when you've got to respond to something. You go, why? Why do that so off brand, et cetera, et cetera. And we've seen car crashes, you know, well documented ones. But that would s suggest to me the brand isn't strong enough in itself to know that it shouldn't have done that or it should have done yeah. that and that sort of thing. So we're seeing an uptick in that. That will, you know, that, that will be a period and then that will run. You don't need to do them every five minutes. So that. What's interesting for me is, will that last as long as the last time they did it? I think it will probably burn through a bit quicker. So they might be back in five years' time to have a new a new one, a new update, et cetera. But we'll see. So that's something I'm watching at the, at the moment as well, which is, uh, uh, you know, interesting. But again, it's symptomatic of exactly what – and as a consequence, that agencies are doing the same because they're – they're a, a business, a B2B business largely, and if their brand is not aligned – uh, to what the market leads, they've got to change it as well. So, yeah, it, it's uh, it's fun time. Yeah, we're all moving quicker than we've ever had to. Um, Tony, to end, I want you to give me, I don't know whether to ask to give tips for the clients or for the agency. So I'm actually going to ask for one or two from each. Okay. Like what do, what do clients need to do to find better agency partners and what do agencies need to do to get found? The one thing that always shocked me when I, and, and it continues to do, and this summer period is no different than any other summer period, 
is I always meant most clients don't give themselves enough time. Sometimes it's because it's more of a distress purchase and therefore they didn't know they were going to do it anyway. So, which is fair enough. But I, I think in today's world with all the moving parts, uh, re reviewing what you've got, staying on top of the performance will avoid some of those disasters. So I think they need to think about how they performance manage their increasing number of agencies. So that's one thing. Uh, the second is if you are going to have to go to market, just give yourselves time because they all think it's going to be easier than it is. But what they don't realize is how good all the agencies are and how close they are and similar they are. Therefore, trying to separate them just needs a bit of time. So that would be my yeah. my advice to them. And for agencies, it, it's you, they talk about being brave. They want brave and ambitious clients. They they need to be prepared to stand out in the cold a little bit more around their point of view, which sets up their brand and their tone of voice. And in order to separate some clear, create some clear water between them and their competitors, because it's an over, it's still an oversupplied market. And therefore, the, the client in that sense senses that and behaves accordingly. But for, for agencies, they've really, really got to look at their point of view and the start of their, their, their brand narrative in order to stand out. And they've just got to be braver at that themselves, never mind looking for a brave client. Um, and when they are, then, you know, they have their purple patch, you know, and, and they do well um, until the next group come along and it's i think it's a team sport you know it's a group of people backed by an agency or whatever and you watch a team that's well connected um and they they have a different level of energy and that's what that's what the clients love they just when they sense that energy that's when you see the connection in a room happen we'll touch on can we touch on a hybrid quickly yeah please I, yes i'm i'm concerned about cut the culture both from the client side and the agency side. So are you talking about, just so I'm super clear here, Tony, hybrid working? Yeah. Yes, we kind of talked about that right at the beginning, off off yeah. camera. I don't know how fast culture will decay and where it will bottom out, but without a doubt, it's a concern. The number of clients we work with who aren't in the office is far more than agencies. Agencies are in the office a lot more. Okay, interesting. Um, and have worked out when they need to be in the office. And sometimes they do it as a totality, but other times they do it, if you like, department by department. So they're given permission to say the creatives need to be in the office. However they want to be in the office, they can be in if the plan is proper. So the different f uh, functioning departments. We may well end up somewhere where there's tools and things that we that help in, in, in the hybrid world. But th there's no doubt about it that ideas are slower if you're apart. And already pitch teams, it, the rule is you come together pretty much, because the ideas move around much faster. Yeah. And it's very hard to, to understand body language when it's just this bit. We might get better at it, but you're trying to scan. It's far easier to see. I mean, I've, I had a client who's once her knees started going like this, I knew she was desperate to ask a question. So I was trying to get, because she was, there was a body language signal and sometimes that her team didn't spot it. And I'm trying to attract attention to say the knees going, so let let her speak because you know she's going to say something important at this point. You couldn't see that on the on Zoom or or Teams. So those little things for me are are, are important. So I, I'm I am concerned about that bonding element at one level. The other one, of course, which again is well documented, is about how do people learn without osmosis and that hearing and seeing and feeling how things work. So I you know I don't want to be a laggard and say you know, or a Luddite and say, you know, it was better back in the day. It, I'm, the, you know, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. So it'll end up somewhere, but I, I have a short-term concern that, that we'll have a dip before we climb out of it again. Where we end up as an answer, I don't know, tools may emerge that help us, but um, yeah, we're an industry of good ideas and we need an environment that helps facilitate good ideas. And there are certain things that kind of work, and it's um, yeah that in that happy accident. I mean, there's someone even in the office the other day. Someone said, "I'm trying to find a word for you know just a piece of writing," and within two minutes we'd explored you know 17 words and we'd settled on one that was the one she wanted. 
I mean, could you? She wouldn't even bother doing yeah. that if it was. I honestly, I'm happy to be a luddite because I honestly so believe in you know exactly what you're saying. I think people need. Yeah, you know, I've been talking a lot today about the importance of humans buying other humans and you know as especially in the world of agency you I think it's really hard if everyone's working from home like you say how do you have those great ideas like I've even t- talking to my leadership team this week a leadership team of two plus me um and we've been super busy recently and I've probably been lone wolfing most of our proposals and pitches which isn't great because if I had them involved, we're going to have better ideas because they're, you know, more involved with the client work that we're doing than I am. They're, you know, at the forefront of everything that's going on. So they'd go, actually, what? Well, how about we do this? Or, you know, it's not great for me to do that on my own. And it's, but it's just been a case of we've been, I mean, which is bad, right? We've been really busy. We have actually won pretty much. Our win rate has been like 100 for the last month or two. It's been like 100% win rate, which is, which is amazing. So obviously it's not doing that bad. But better ideas come from us collaborating. Like I loved going into the office when I was younger. I also, you know, I was very lucky to work at, you know, cool, you know, drinks brands and stuff. Yeah, you know, I used to love the days where I worked from home and I went to go and see clients. Yeah. But a lot of the time I would be, you know, I mean, our office for Pana Ricard was in Hounslow. It definitely wasn't particularly exciting to go there. But I loved going there because I learned. I got to meet our brand managers, our brand directors and people that I could learn from and listen to and yeah. be in meetings. Like you, you don't get that in the same way. You don't build those relationships and you know, build those allies in the business and outside of the business that are, you know, the people that I met there, I'm still friends with now that, yeah, you know, and that's because we went for drinks after work. I made the effort to go. I didn't even have to go into the office in my job back then, but I think that those relationships, you can't build them on Zoom. I'm sorry, you just can't. So most of our pitches are face-to-face. Good. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, we get, every, everyone accepts that face-to-face and we, we encourage that. Now, if it's a global one, it's you, harder. You, yeah. you kind of understand that maybe we don't need to fly everyone around the world and all this sort of stuff. So there are ways around around that. And, you know, the technology is at least reliable these days. I remember pitching on on a, a video thing was a four second delay many, many years ago. And it was, it, you know, it was pretty you know, clunky. Today, it, it, it works. During COVID, we were able to run chemistry meetings through uh, Zoom and Teams and stuff, and agencies adapted as they always do very rapidly, as did the client, and it it worked. So if you like, the good news was business could continue, but now now we're out of out of that. It's um, it's an interesting phase from a, you know in a hundred years time when someone looks back and it's in it's taught in schools, it it'll just be interesting to see where we net out. But yeah, it's it's concerning i think long long term because it's still you watch people by people and yeah how do you give of your best and how do you demonstrate you are a cohesive team if you haven't seen each other for yeah it's hard know, right however long you yeah know? the yeah. robots are coming but we're still staying the generation that's that's lived through it is fine because they they know how to do both the next generation is the concern for me which is like they this is their new normal yeah and they don't know well, they get anxious. I think I've spoken about this before. Like I say to my daughter, like, we're going to pick up one of her friends that, to go training together for, you know, she's mm. an athlete. So, and I'll be like, phone Sienna and let her know we're outside. She's like, no, 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 no. I've, I've messaged her on Snapchat. I'm like, just freaking phone her. But they don't, you know, they're, they're almost scared, like, picking up the phone. I mean, she's not scared to pick up the phone to me. <laughs> got 10 missed calls in a row. But there, you, that is a worrying thing. Like you, And she's 16 and my daughter is far from shy. But the world that she's grown up in, that when I was younger, I would spend hours on the phone to my friend every night. That doesn't happen anymore. They're snapping each other. It's all done digitally. And that comes through and in, back into client agency relationships. So again, we, we've had a lot of conversations with senior management about something was going wrong with client services so a number of years ago we started developing a number of seminars on that subject and breaking the thing down and one of the issues was is they won't ring the client up they they will just text or email and things like that. so they they've lost the art of conversation and have lost the confidence of it which is the other thing you know that that side of it is yeah some are naturally good at it obviously but for those who are more anxious and it's it become it's more of a learned skill for them then where's the where's the framework to help them yeah, we've through, got to. Through that. And that's a that's definitely another issue that we've come across back whew, probably 2016. I mean, that's almost 10 years now. We've been chipping away at it. Yeah. About, you know, what's 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 gone wrong with account management, as it were. So that's 
that's again at the heart of the relationship. And there's there's other mitigating circumstances with pressure on costs and stuff. Agencies were protecting strategy and output, be that creative or media plans or whatever it was, the output, and they sacrificed the that was the bit they said, well, we can get rid of them. But you they forget that they were the glue. You know, a stool needs a minimum of three legs for it to stand up. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you chop one off, it'll fall yeah, over. Yeah, right? exactly. So, Even so. with three, it's pretty struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, if people want to find out more about the AAR, where can they go? Well, we have a we website. have a website, <laughs> <laughs> right. and we're on we're all over LinkedIn. Like you, like you said, we uh, definitely switched our marketing onto LinkedIn. So yeah. there's articles. We're much better at producing our own content and stuff like that individually as well as uh, collectively. But yeah, the, uh, there's a website, um, aargroup.co.uk. So, Brilliant. Um, or find me on LinkedIn. And yeah, I- well, that's the proper way to do it. Is yeah, I will make sure in the show notes that we've got a link to Tony's LinkedIn profile, yeah. to the AR, and to the website. You still do the annual report? Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. there's also. I mean, the, the whole research thing has changed. You know, so again, driven by what clients are telling us and agencies are telling us, we our research program is much more robust now so there's always big reports to download and uh all the way back we try and keep them all on there so can i ask a selfish question because i want to know what's the average opportunity you know or pitch to win ratio nowadays for agencies it's it, it's pretty much the same about 35 percent usually one in yeah. three is the kind yeah. is the traditional average that yeah. i've always worked yeah. on if if everything's going well that's that's what you'd expect and then versions. Obviously, if you're in your prime, that goes, that gets better. If you're low, it goes down. And you know, like all these things, it's as a business, how do you adapt when competition in the market is increasing or new players cut right, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got they've got exactly the same problems as clients have in that regard. But yeah, that would be a target that everyone goes for. Yeah. Tony, I want to ask you so much more, but we are going to get kicked out of the studio. <laughs> so thank you so much Pleasure. for joining me. Lovely Honestly, I feel like we should have like some kind of annual yeah, yeah. download yeah. or something. So yeah, big thank you for All coming right. on Pleasure. and thank you for sharing so much. Right. No worries. Hey guys, me again. I hope you enjoyed the episode that you've just listened to. And if you did, I'm going to do the, you know, the annoying thing that all podcasters do, which is go and ask you to subscribe because it really does make a difference to our rankings. And please do go subscribe, leave a comment, give us a five-star review if you did love it. If you want to get in touch, do check out the email address in the show notes. Most importantly, again, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe by clicking the button somewhere that is on this screen. Um, And it'll mean that you get notified when new episodes go live.